Okay. Hi, thanks for coming. I am Christina Schulman. This is Etienne Perot. We are SREs at Google. We are going to talk about data center automation systems, ways that they have gone spectacularly wrong for us, and technical measures that we've put into place to prevent this. Um, first, this is important. This talk is not just for companies with huge data center footprints. If you've got a smaller system, if you're still growing, if you're running in other people's buildings, this is the time to start thinking about the kind of safety constraints that you want to implement and grow with them instead of waiting until you are 100 times bigger and more complex. So, machine automation. Um, Google uses automation systems to manage most of our machine operations. This is repairs, installs, reinstalls, decoms, pretty much anything that we do with machines. Because of the volume of machines that we have, our automations has to be very fast and efficient. This means that when you ask it to do something stupid, and we will ask it to do something stupid, it will do that for you happily and very efficiently. So, this brings us to educational experience number one. Uh, that time that Google erased our entire content delivery network. This has been covered in several public talks, and it, uh, chapter seven of the SRE book goes into detail about it. But briefly, uh, our content delivery network, CDN, serves non-video static content closer to the users from colos at the edge of our network. This means that users get faster responses, and we don't have all of that traffic transiting our internal network all the time. So, uh, an engineer needed to send one rack of these machines to disk erase. Unfortunately, a bad interaction with the machine database and a non-item potent command caused the query to match all of the CDN machines instead of just one rack. And off they all went to disk erase very efficiently. As a result, there was uh, public badness, slow user queries, uh, a lot of internal network congestion, two days of really painful manual cleanup. But Google is full of really smart people. We found the root cause, we fixed the bug, it'll never happen again. I'm sensing skepticism. Um, so several months later, <laughs> educational experience number two. Um, this is actually a failure that we've never talked about in public before, so congratulations. You get to be the first to hear about it. Once upon a time, Google decommissioned all of our tunneling load balancers. Um, so a tunneling load balancer, a TLB, encapsulates and forwards network packets to their intended destination. Google used to use dedicated switches as TLBs for all the traffic coming into the, network, into the uh, data centers. Um, there was a utility script, yay. It was used to send retired switches of lots of different kinds to decom, to be decommissioned. However, the script had not been run for several months. It was newly run, and unfortunately, in the meantime, the nature of the underlying data had changed. As a result, basically, there was a flag that it was using to identify switches that were still in use. This flag was not populated for any of the TLBs. So every single TLB matched as retired, and off they all went to decom. Um, the good news, is that these TLBs were not sophisticated enough to know that they were in a DCOM state, and they just kept serving traffic until they were disabled. If this hadn't been the case, we'd have had a major widespread service interruption. So, these two incidents had completely different root causes, and fixing the first one in no way protected us from the second one. But we would really like this to stop happening. So, what can we do? Well, we've got common patterns in our root causes, in these and hypothetical other incidents. Um, overmatching of machine queries. We've got changing assumptions in the code and in the data. Uh, complicated systems getting more complicated every day. And nothing's going to save you from a really unsafe rollout. But when you've got dozens of client systems using your automation, no matter how, how carefully you apply your best practices, you're simply not going to be able to ensure that they're all well-behaved and safe all the time. And even if they're well-behaved in isolation, when they interact with each other, um, 
sometimes really bad things are just going to happen when they interfere with each other. So that's no good. On the bright side, they're all using the same mechanism of destruction, which is to say your poor innocent machine automation. So you can build a central mechanism to mitigate that risk of horrible things happening to your machines. And this is critical. Bake it directly into your automation system so that it acts as a gatekeeper and it can't be bypassed. So Etienne is going to talk about uh, the mitigation system we use after our magic transition slide. Woo, there we go. It is live. Yes. All right. So production at Google. Complicated. will always get more complicated because that's how it goes. But we would like it to keep running. Every team has uh, you know, scheduled pushes. They all want to do their thing. They all have different definitions of what's safe, what's unsafe. But what everybody agrees on is that production shall keep running. That we as SREs can encode that assertion with SLOs. Right? We set SLOs. And if they are respected, then production should mostly be keeping running. And so what if we were to slightly ever complicate the production infrastructure graph further and add one more node in that graph to ensure that those assertions remain true over time and protect our data centers. That's essentially what Google did in 2009, starting in 2009 with a system that we call Seriously, after uh, basically its mode of operation that you always ask it if, if, uh, if it's okay to do something and it's asking you, are you serious? It's prevented many outages since then, uh, but not the two that Christina just mentioned, <laughs> unfortunately, due to its lack of involvement, not because of a bug in it. Here's how we went about uh, creating that system. First, we need to enumerate all the production workflows that need to be protected against. This is easy if you're doing it uh, as you start out. It is very hard if you do it after the fact, which is part of the problem here. Uh, but you know, try your best. And once you have those listed, then figure out what the blast radius could be if they were to happen too often or too broadly at once, and you have an idea of what to protect against. Here's a few examples of uh, what is currently being protected by seriously at Google. So machine upgrades, those would be kernel upgrades, firmware upgrades, uh, updating system demons that run on machines, this sort of thing. Storage trains, where we copy user data to ma other machines from a machine so we can put that machine into maintenance. Marketing VMs, uh, moving shuffling roll around to uh, make room or to reshuffle them across racks so they're a little more spread across failure domains. Pushing data center-wide configs that have high uh, failure blast radius in case something goes wrong, like if you're pushing new versions of production infrastructure systems. And uh, larger scope maintenance, like if you're shutting down racks at a time because you need to access to the back plane for power work or whatever, you ought to be able to also control these at the rate at which they happen. Once you got all those figured out, uh, which is not easy, but once you do, uh, time to think about which constraints uh, make sense to be applied for each of them. So it, it's hard to come up with this uh, from scratch, but one good source of, of inspiration is your SLOs. You can actually turn them into constraints for most cases. For example, if you have an SLO that says that at all times 99% of machines in all my data centers shall be available, you can turn this into a constraint by saying that if there is more than like 0.8% of machines currently uh, unavailable, then I'm going to stop planned maintenance to prevent more machines from entering the the unavailable state and ensure that we stay below 1%. So we've built a bunch of uh, constraints of this kind uh, across all the workloads I mentioned, and a few patterns emerge. So this is essentially uh, the list of, of constraints that uh, are useful to apply in most cases. Simplest one is the rate limit, uh, where you allow some number of things to happen every time period, every bucket. For example, for the TLB thing, if you had at the time a uh, allow at most 1% of the TLBs in your data center, every hour to be sent to DCOM, then uh, all the decoming of TLBs would have taken at least 100 hours, which is enough time for a human to notice and get involved, which is the idea with the rate limit. Concurrency limit is closely related, but it doesn't have a time component to it. It's about uh, ensuring that there is no more than some number or some percentage of things in a state at a given time. So if you are rebooting all machines because you're upgrading the Linux kernel on all of them, for example, you would want to ensure that no more than some percentage of them are currently rebooting before you allow more to reboot. <laughs> Sanity and policy checks, essentially those are like assert statements, but instead of code, it's a cross-production state, where if you expect some properties to always be true when you're doing one of those workflows, then you can actually turn that into constraint and check that it is actually true. For example, if you're rebooting all the machines, 
it makes no sense to do that while there's still stuff running on them. So make sure that there's actually no stuff running on them and you won't get surprised. Service-specific health checks, uh, mostly relevant at Google or multi-tenant infrastructure where you have many different services like Gmail, Web Search, Google Cloud, each of which has a different uh, definition of uh, what, is, what it means to, for a service to be healthy, what it means for a machine or a data center to be good. Um, and so it's, if we were to implement specific constraints for each of them, it would be pretty um, uh, specialized to each service. There's one uh, way to abstract all of this across services, though, and that's to look at their monitoring system, because all of these services need some kind of pager and, and uh, alerting system, and it's uh, mostly consistent across a single company like Google. So you can turn that into a data source for safety constraints and check that there's not been no recent alert or pages in a rotation. For example, if you're disrupting a web search machine, check if the web search on caller hasn't been paged recently so that you don't turn a, a problem into a bigger one. Last one is automatic breaking, where you can look at recent uh, approvals that, you, that the constraint has approved and look at whether or not they cause pain. For example, if you're uh, upgrading all the firmware on all rack switches across the data center and you notice that the last few upgrades uh, made the switches stop forwarding packets, maybe you should stop upgrading rack switches, right? Once you have all those constraints figured out, the API is pretty simple. It's a single uh, function call that takes an entity, which is what's being affected, like a machine or a VM or a rack or a data center, and the intent is what's being done to it, like upgrading the kernel or moving a machine to another one, draining storage of the machine, uh, pushing new configs, all, and so on. And you return just whether or not it's safe to do, and a reason string that says why or why not it's safe. Request link is pretty simple. You get a request. You gather data about that request. For example, if you're being requested about a single machine, you can look at the VMs running on it so that you can see that there's no VMs running on it. Once you have the data, you map it to a list of constraints that you should be evaluating. Evaluate all those in parallel. Aggregate the results. If any of them say no, you return no. If all of them say yes, you record that so that you can keep track of approvals for rate limits and whatnot, and you return yes. Pretty simple flowchart. Now, as this system becomes um, ingrained into the production ecosystem, what's going, what tends to happen is that uh, other systems overly rely on it to be correct, and um, it's, it makes it dangerous because now its configuration is, a critical, is critical to be, to be safe, and it needs to be safe from itself. So you could, for example, forget to apply rate limits in a bad release, and now you are vulnerable to the same uh, kind of uh, incident as uh, Christina just mentioned. To avoid this, the best practices apply, like regression tests to ensure that you do see the constraints you expect being applied, uh, internal sanity checks on other systems that, so that you don't only output your sanity checks in a single system, big red buttons everywhere. But one uh, simple and efficient way we've found is to shard that system uh, by entity. If you run, for example, if you sh partition your entities by data center, like all the machines are part of that partition, you can then run one instance of the system for each of those partitions and uh, only have them respond to the subset of entities that are part of it. And then when you need a new configuration, you can roll it out across those instances slowly to ensure that the configuration change doesn't apply to everything at once. Behavior override is also another useful feature. We've uh, had several cases for it come up. For example, our uh, uh, Project Zero team, which finds uh, vulnerabilities in things like the Linux kernel, will publish something, and they have a 90-day uh, responsible disclosure deadline, which they impose on us the same way as they do on other companies. So we're held to the same standards. And usually, 90 days is enough to upgrade all the kernels on all the machines at, uh, at Google, but sometimes it's not. And we need to go faster, because it's uh, better to be a little unsafe to roll out than to run unpatched Linux kernels in production. So we, it's useful to be able to uh, make it go a little faster sometimes. Or you can go the other way, go slower. For example, if you have a user-facing uh, customer visible cloud demo going on, you want to reduce entropy, you can also you know, make it uh, stop approving anything for a while to ensure that production doesn't really change much uh, for some time. These are useful, but they're also dangerous because they introduce behavior that hasn't been tested before. Uh, so it's useful to be able to keep a lid on them, for example, you can have an expiration on them that is enforced to not be too long in the future to ensure that it will automatically revert to uh, the known configuration at some point. Uh, you can uh, restrict them by a subset of uh, yes, uh, entities and intents to ensure they're not too broad. And 
uh, you can do more than just approve or deny, but like disable specific constraints that are buggy or uh, uh, change some rate limit budgets to make them slightly slower or faster as opposed to completely disabled and so on. Another problem we found that uh, happens when you're a large company uh, and you have many of those systems interacting with each other is you have a system A that's doing something on B and B doesn't like it because uh, it's kind of doing it, A is doing it too often or not changing for constraints. B implements constraints and seriously and that's great but what happens is A just keeps doing it anyway and now B is angry because they spent this time implementing constraints but it's not really being effective. Or you could have many other A's and it's hard to coordinate rollouts to ensure that they all are taking seriously all the time. Uh, so one solution to this is to have A actually get a short-lived certificate from the safety constraint system and present that to B and then B can ensure that yes, the safety, uh, safety constraints were indeed checked uh, by whatever is doing the disruptive operation. Okay, so uh, just to sum up, if you've got a lot of machines, if you've got complicated systems, things are going to go horribly wrong. Um, sorry. If you want to protect your service guarantees, figure out the safety constraints that make sense for your system and bake them in as soon as you can, as early in your growth as you can, and put them right in the systems they're protecting so that they can act as a gatekeeper. And that's all we got. Any questions? Uh, when building this system for uh, safety checks, have you gotten pushback from other stakeholders saying, I don't want to deal with this system or I'm going to need to get X out more quickly? And how do you deal with those conversations? You want me to answer? Um, well, in the general case, I will say that having a massive user visible outage is very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, can yes. you speak better to the individual? Uh, well, the, when you have a knowledge, yes, but that is retroactive. It's nicer to uh, be in a position where you can proactively have those constraints. And if you word them as being derived from your SLOs, I think that's a good justification because you already have agreed on those SLOs and you're just protecting them. The Thanks. biggest barrier is the additional complexity because our brains are all full. Yeah, so you're basing this off of your SLOs. Uh, how often do you run into situations where um, those constraints make changes so slow that it just slows everything to a grinding halt? Uh, grinding halt is kind of a strong term. Well, uh, yeah. But no, uh, sometimes? Uh, so when it is an emergency, like with, when you have a zero day that you need to revolve quickly, yes, like everybody agrees, you, you need to go faster. Usually, though, you would design them to have a good balance between not being too close to the SLO, or you need to be a little more, I mean, less conservative than that, but still fast for general purpose. It gets more complicated when you have competing systems asking for the same approvals, and uh, things like fairness and starvation start to come into play. Yes, there's um, prioritization and uh, client starvation, yes, issues. So. Hello. Um, there is a theory that the more safety features you introduce, the less your clients will use like thinking before doing something, right? So do you have numbers how often the system helped you, like really prevented some disaster? Do you see any trends? Um, this is, by the way, the last, I'm being told this is our last question. Um, it is really hard to know when you've averted a disaster, which is regrettable because we'd love to be promoted. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have stats on how much was rejected and approved over time, but of course that's no, you know, it doesn't indicate that an outage would have happened if we went faster. All right. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. <laughs>